should give it hi everyone who is here already i can see there's a few of you give it probably just give it like 30 seconds and then we'll get going um just liam and me today no fran big character missing <laughs> <laughs> let me get slides up as well be helpful cool okay we will get going i hope that most of you are all here and can all see the slides okay um and drop us a message in the chat or in the q a um at any point if you have any issues but really excited to be back actually because it's been probably gosh like three months since we did one of these sort of live events and you'll have noticed that we're sort of we've rebranded um and we're going to be trying out a bit of a different format um today so anyone who previously has tuned into one of our demandism episodes will um probably notice a bit of a difference in terms of how this runs and um really really keen to get your feedback if you prefer it um, if it works for you or if there's sort of something missing that we haven't covered that you'd like to see or things that you miss from the demandism, um, yeah, pop it in the chat, Q&A, please, because we want to make sure that this is as helpful for you as it is possible. Um, but yeah, really happy to be joined by Liam, who's our VP of Marketing. Um, and then I guess let's just get into why are we called The Loop? Why have we gone through this big kind of rebrand and relaunch of this live event? So to give you some context, we've been doing a lot of thinking about like our narrative and what we think, how we think about the world and how we think about B2B marketing more generally and how that shaped what we do at Cognizant. And what we decided is we want to bring marketers in the loop of what's working in today's market, because we all know that B2B buying behavior has changed significantly. Um, everyone's talking about it. There's tons of LinkedIn posts out there, Gartner reports, etc. But I guess the bigger question is, what are we actually doing about it? And how is that translating into how we actually market today? Um, it's definitely up to us as marketers to learn how B2B buyers actually want to be communicated with and engaged with in today's world and how we can impact that and influence those purchasing decisions. Um, and that's why we want to keep you in the loop of what's working and what we're finding works today. Um, and yeah, we're inviting you to kind of join us on this journey as always, as we work out those tactics and things that we find really resonate when, in today's world. Um, so what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna to talk about this whole notion of B2B buying behavior having changed, um, how we know that to be true and what we're seeing as a general overview. And then really importantly, like how can marketers win now that the shift has taken place? And what is a realistic plan of attack for a marketer who can't just throw out everything they're doing um, and but still wants to try and make a shift. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the agenda for today. And that's the reason behind us having shifted a little bit in terms of, um, yeah, what we look like and what we're talking about. Um, and that is why we are The Loop Live. So kicking us off on how do we know B2B buying behavior has changed. Now, I think we are probably all very aligned to this and it's like not going to fall on deaf ears, the things that I'm going to say, but I just wanted like to really quickly highlight, I guess, the proof points um, for why this is the situation that we're dealing with today. So if we think back to how the process used to work, it took a lot of work for buyers to research any B2B product or service for themselves. So actually salespeople could pretty much say what they wanted about what they were selling and buyers had not much choice but to believe them but the digital world has definitely matured um to where it is today and like previous to, to today review sites didn't really exist online communities were in their infancy and most of social media sites were starting to find their feet and actually there was a point when if you think about it linkedin was just basically a job board so b2 marketers actually had limited direct access to customers so it would probably be things like trade shows or email and primitive search engine optimized blog content. These are the types of tactics that we were deploying in order to, to engage with our, our customers and prospects. Um, and so marketing's job was to try and actually just compile lists of like contact data that people that sales could reach out to over the phone and start to have conversations with. And that's because there just wasn't another way of doing it. But over the last decade, there's definitely been ex an explosion in terms of channels and access to customers and prospects. 
And we have to be aware of the fact that buyers now live in an always on world. They have 24 seven access to the internet, to social media platforms and online communities. It is just the norm that they're participating in these every day. So scrolling your feed for entertainment, news, work and research, all those lines are blurred today. Um, and so it's hard for us. Our jobs definitely got more difficult. We're living in an age of unprecedented interconnectivity. So in many ways, it's more difficult and it's easier. Um, so we have got this ability to target more of our audience than we ever did before. Um, but I think the problem is that many marketers are still stuck in this uh, sort of servicing sales mentality. So helping them to build lists of leads to talk to trapped in a world where the priority is lead volume and MQLs, instead of actually creating strategies to reach audiences on these platforms that they're already engaging in. Um, and that's kind of the, I think that's like the summary of, of the problem that a lot of marketers are facing today. It's acknowledging that yes, the world has changed, but actually a lot of models that marketers are being forced to operate towards have not caught up with the times. And that ultimately forces you down this path of, um, yeah, acting like um, you're servicing sales. So, you know, back in 2012, prospect data was limited. Marketing was required to build databases, sort of, of let's call them warm leads, um, and then pass them to sales so they could go and do outbound to them. It's also the case that PPC ad costs used to be a lot lower and there was much lower levels of competition. Um, so actually lead gen three performance marketing was a much more viable option back then than it is today. Um, yeah, and we were too bought, I think we were too bought into the rise of attribution and attribution software as well in a bid to get data driven. So this whole idea of trying to connect all marketing decisions um, to what we saw in Google Analytics and Salesforce. And that's led to budgets being allocated in the wrong directions many times as well. Um, and so ultimately all of this has sort of seen the rise of this whole lead generation um, performance-based marketing bandwagon. And the problem with that today is actually what's happening is the cost of, of doing that and running those plays has gone up significantly. Um, so they're not actually viable and scalable in the way that they were before. And ultimately buyers are rebelling. It's not how they want to be sold to. It's not how they want to be marketed to and it's not how, how they're purchasing. Um, so all of that said, we've set the scene. Um, and so the question is, okay, great. Might buy into this, might agree. But what are we going to do about it? So I'm going to hand over to Liam to kind of kick us off and cover some of this. Also, um, notice we've got a few questions which we will come round to, but I'll let Liam get started and then we'll bring up the questions um, probably after you've covered this, this next section, Liam. But yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, Alice kind of touched on it. We need to... Um, mar like, key theme here is Mark is just... We need to be more than um, just sales support. Um, and, you know, the marketing function, um, like now previously, as, as I said, like we were, it was hard to get contact data in general. Um, email wasn't saturated either. So like email addresses were like key in, in the type of marketing that you were doing because we, we could just like reach them, reach with people out on uh, email. And we all got, we've all been kind of hooked on this direct attribution um, so that uh, well, we could say like this campaign uh, led to this revenue and we could follow it through with um uh through the, like that that whole process um but you know things are sort of uh, the digital world as as Alice said has completely changed everything um and we kind of want to move to a situation now where marketing is uh educating buyers you know way before um they're they're actually coming to to us ready to buy um as people want to go out and do all their research themselves window shopping uh and try and find out as much as they can about the product before um they actually come and speak to sales <clears throat> and it's because they now are fully able to do so they don't need to come speak to sales um until they um in, in, yeah, until they're, they're ready to um so that's where we need to now be focused uh and that means that we have to change everything that we're doing from uh the marketing the the marketing that we're putting out the um uh like the attribution and the reporting that we're measuring uh, the, all of our marketing on as well however we know that this switch is like it's not like an easy one uh and i think i i, I did a little post about it like trying to sort of like position this event and like what we'll be talking about and um i think it's really easy to be like oh 
you know, this is the old way. This is the new way. You've got to make, uh, you've got to make that move. You've got to turn to this, like, to this new demand generation marketing where, um, you know, you're not collect just collecting MQLs and leads. Mm-hmm. But realistically, um, in the real world, uh, we have whole organizations that are set up to, to run these lead generation operations. Uh, and you can't just turn it off and move over. Also, there are still loads of cases where lead gen might still benefit you um, and just to switch off um, would would be kind of reckless really um, when you're not ready to like make this switch in general. Um, so, you know, at Cognizant, we actually scaled our lead gen uh, like approach before we made the switch to like, we were getting like probably about 2000 leads a month. Uh, and, and to be fair, like I think, and Alice always says this, we were actually doing lead gen really well. Um, uh, like it was actually kind of working for us, but we knew it wasn't scalable. Um, if we, when we split the funnel down and we looked at uh, the rate at which those leads were converting from lead to um, a revenue, like to close one, then it was like, we're looking at like 0.2%. Um, so there's only, we can't just, you know, how many leads are we going to have to generate to be able to generate the revenue that we're going to need in the future? Um, it just, it's just not scalable. And I think that's what actually made us switch. Um, so, we going through that switch um was obviously like it wasn't something that we could just turn on and off so we actually it actually took us about uh a year and a half and now i still think that's pretty quick for a company and there's many companies where you know every company's different um it's going to be really difficult to just you know move uh from one strategy to another when you know you've probably got loads of processes in place people tied up in roles that are actually completely servicing um a lead generation function as well and all of that's got to change um but the key part of that switch we did was it was a sort of like a phased approach um the first six months um of trying to make that switch as well we were definitely we were running uh, both alongside each other like building out this demand gen function um where we were trying to educate buyers ahead of time, uh, learning and testing, uh, while still running the lead gen function that we needed for the business um, so that we could, you know, still deliver on on the things that were working for us at the time. Um, And that's something that you can then do. Uh, It doesn't have to be an all or nothing, turn one thing off and put another thing on. Um, You can be running both at the same time. And actually, at the point that we turned lead generation off, wasn't really because we were just like, okay, done, dusted, now we're we're finished with that. Uh, It was actually just because we didn't need it um, because we'd actually managed to build up um, a demand generation function that was creating enough demand and filling our pipeline better than the lead generation uh, function ever was. And and in fact, you know, we won the whole business over and and sales were even asking us to do it. So um, you can make- I think on that point, actually, sorry, just quick, because it's an important point. It's not necessarily that you don't want to think about it as a lead gap. Like what's the lead gap that you're going to have to generate from demand gen versus lead gen? It's actually, what's the revenue gap? So when you think back to Liam saying at 0.2% was the rate of conversion from content MQL to revenue. When we looked at what that looked like from a revenue figure, the overall revenue that we were bringing in, that we were targeted on that marketing was responsible for, that portion of the pie that was delivered by MQLs was disproportionately small compared to the amount of leads that we were bringing in through it so actually once you understand what that revenue gap is it becomes really clear like what you're signing up to bridge the gap with from a whole like the demand gen approach so the declared intent inbounds and I think really understanding that figure is what's going to get you your your kind of focus to to know that like that's what that's what you need to sell into the business that I can cover this gap very easily with a different way Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and actually breaking part of breaking free of this sort of like sales support role is is all on that in that um, we were there was a time obviously where the we were generating enough inbound demand um, that we're like we we started to make up some of this gap from from lead gen. Um, and then uh, when it's, sales are actually feeding back to us that, you know, there's too many the content needs that the, the the leads that we've got from lead generation content they're too easy to book in for the SDRs but the actual meetings themselves don't go anywhere so we've got SDRs all hitting quota booking uh, content um, leads and then the AEs have got uh, calendars full of um, meetings that then don't go anywhere and it's, it's a waste of all of their time 
Um, and then when we can, when we actually then were able to pull out and like look at the data again because we created um, th that many more inbounds, it was as easy as maybe in some like some different like um, segments. It's just like okay, so we've we've literally just got to make up. There's like maybe four or five deals that have actually come from lead generation, um, and so we just got to make up four or five deals. And at that point, mm -hmm. because we'd already started this process, it was like we were very confident that we'd be able to do that, and sales were very happy to go along with it as well because you know it's four or five it's four or five deals in that case for us, and and that was something that we felt was achievable. So I think that's that like benefit of it being like a phased approach. And then by the end of that, we really had like broken free, I suppose, of being sales support because we were now you know only providing high intent inbounds and, and none of these like mql leads that um that sdrs would follow up on themselves um but i think importantly the way we started it uh and to get that um to get that sort of like a buy-in we, we we actually went away and we said uh what alice did and and requested that we got like a testing budget to 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 map this out um and that testing budget importantly was kind of separate to what we were everything we were running um on lead gen so um it wasn't going to impact um and that was the important bit it's not going to impact what we were uh, currently doing um and from that we were we just set ourselves the hypothesis that we'd be able to using that testing budget increase the number of inbound demo leads in line with the additional spend that we we were then putting in uh, and we did that over three months. Now, I think it varies for businesses again, because I'd say that um, it's really two to three times your um, sales cycle as to when you can start to see like the impact of your demand generation um, efforts. And uh, we have like a fairly short sales cycle at, at Cognizant, so we're able to see some of these uh, you know, changes quicker. Um, but over those three months, we managed to see uh, a 47% increase in, in, in demo requests, which was, was huge. And that was before we'd really even got into actually how to do uh, like dub demand generation properly. Like at that point, we were kind of just like ungating some of our content. We weren't really taking it much further than that and actually thinking about the content and how to serve it. So that gave us like the confidence that then we could go forward and start to like move budget away from lead gen and more into demand gen to like continue along that, that path. Amazing. So I guess the next bit is, okay, um, we're brought into this kind of, we, we understand that the world's changed, we need to do things differently, all sounds great. But if you're stuck in one of these organizations where it's harder um, to make that change, I would say to you that there are things that should be in your control that you can start doing today to actually get set yourself up for this whole new way of like doing demand gen that shouldn't really impact anything else that you're running, no plays that you're running today. Um, and it will ultimately, by putting these things in place, not only will you actually start creating demand anyway, um, but also you set yourself up ultimately for that transition like later down the line. So I would, even if you just choose a couple of these things, like strongly encourage that you look at, that, at them as things to sort of dip your toe in the water, or if you're gonna go all guns blazing into the demand gem world, then this is definitely kind of a good uh, footprint for, for the kind of things that we did at Cognizant to really get us off the ground. So what are the things um, that you can start doing? Number one, I would really recommend this whole idea of either identifying, um, well, identifying and working out who is going to be the subject matter expert for your content. This is so important because when you pivot away from lead gen, obviously a lot of your content in the lead gen world, in world is a uh, it gets hidden behind a form and then it gets hidden behind the fact that people download it and probably never actually read it anyway. Um, and so you create all these barriers that make the content really difficult to engage with. So actually the barrier for that content needing to be good becomes a lot lower. But when you start doing demand gen and you're free to view, you're free to air, you're like, you're really, really, really relying on people like seeing a ton of value in everything that you're putting out. The, onus is on you that everything that goes out is of another level of quality like and that only way to ensure that that is the case is to have it subject matter expert led and so at Cognizant we work with subject matter experts I find the best way to do this but if you're just starting out dipping your toe in the water you can definitely just do this by like outreaching to people and having them contribute to the odd 
blog, video, etc. Lots of people are very happy to do that without needing to pay for them to do so. However, if you're really looking at this from a scalable perspective and putting the foundations in place for what it looks like to, do, to run a great demand gen playbook, you want to have a subject matter expert that either sits internally is, and is committed to a level of content production every month, every quarter, or you're paying someone external in order to do that. So we have a combination of both. So on the marketing side, it's a case of Liam, myself and Fran committing to a level of SME um, led content every month and quarter. And we're not obviously paid for that. That's just part of like what we do at Cognizant within our roles. And then on the sales side, because we don't want to be kind of um, disrupting our sales org from what their business and, and first job is, which is closing business or booking meetings. We actually work with external SME experts and we pay them and we work with them on a basis where we'll um, agree, again, an amount of content output per month, per quarter that they will commit to. And that works so much better because it means that both my team are held accountable, their subject matter expert is held accountable, um, and we just have that sort of regular cadence going forward. And also, I think they they will see the value much better than if it's something where it's, you know, free. I think you get what you pay for in many cases. So um, really recommend that being being a, a, a something that's really important for you to start doing if you're not doing it already. Um, the other thing that's really easy as well is, again, this is going to feed into what you run on your organic um, channels, but optimizing the content you share on LinkedIn. So I this was a this has been a couple of transitions for us to really get this right. But our link organic LinkedIn company page has like shot up um, over the past sort of year and a half since we really, really focused on a strategy for LinkedIn. And beyond that, we also focused on a wider strategy around social media. So it's, we're not doing all the channels. We, we just know that our audience is mainly on LinkedIn. This is the one we care about the most. We're going to have a concerted effort to have a strategy behind this that has as much data-driven approach as any other paid channel that we run. Um, and we fully went value-led over promotional-led. And this is a mindset shift. And it's a mindset shift for the organization. It's a mindset shift for the people who run that channel as well. Um, and in the early days, I had to literally like look at every single post that we were putting out on LinkedIn to say yes or no to, because that you're, you're, you'll be amazed by how ingrained we are to just put out these sort of promotional, like one-off blog promotion posts or whatever it may be, promotional webinar, whatever, um, on our LinkedIn channels without thinking about who is this for? Is it like bottom up, middle out, top down? And actually what value are they getting from this post? And so once we made a really clear line that no promotional content was going on our company page and it had to be value-led, we started to see a massive uptake in across all of the um key metrics that, that that page was driving and we still have a really strict like cadence of approval and um like content production for that page as well so Liam and I still view every every post that's going out on our LinkedIn organic channel I think that's really important because we've identified it as a key part of the strategy and approach um, but yeah that's something that you can really 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 easily start doing today and experimenting with different content formats so whether it's just long form text um it, whether it's taking polls and then actually adding insight into the, the um insights for the polls carousels we found carousels weirdly organically on linkedin work really well carousels paid work really badly um but if you want like a way to really engage the audience that's a great way too and just always trying to think like as well this is like zero click content i don't want people to have to go anywhere i want them to be able to read this and take away something that helps helpful for them today and they haven't had to click or leave the channel to do so as well um, so that's those are two those two things. The next thing, which was something that we actually kind of didn't get really good at until probably like six months into our journey in this sort of demand gen approach, but it's this whole idea of upping your game when it comes to bottom of funnel content. And I think what can get misconstrued in this move away from lead gen to demand gen and thinking about adding value all the time to prospects is that okay well that's got to be really thought leadership there that's got to be really like top level we can't talk about us at all we can't talk about the product but actually you are going to want to talk about the product and you are going to want to be able to communicate the value that your product can bring to your customers and your prospects um but you need to be doing this in like clever ways and you need to be doing this in ways in which the again the buyer can self-serve that information um, and so it's things like having being not being afraid to have ungated product tours, having what we did was like we wanted to really ramp how we did 
um, video case studies. So we actually just got our customer success team to talk through on video, basically a product demo of a way or a workflow in which a customer was successful using Cognizant without us having to actually mention the customer directly. Um, and that got us out of the whole approvals and all of that slowing down stuff that happens when you have to go down the, the customer route. Um, and then you can actually use uh, tools like Novatic or there's many others out there as well, which allow you to do like interactive product tours and all of these, um, these different ways that you can get creative in showcasing the product and service that you offer and the value that it brings to your customers and prospects. And you want to have a wide variety of it for sure. And doubling down on that has been absolutely massive for us in terms of being successful in what we're doing. And then a big thing is that at Cognizant, we're really trying to go all in on this idea of a media machine. So I think like a lot of people talk about it, they're like, B2B marketing, they, you need to be like a media company, but okay, what does that actually look like? Well, anyone who saw our launch of the CMO diary, I think that's probably a really good example of like a media machine activity that we did. It's like quite a tra traditional kind of media um, piece. Like it was a book, we launched a book, but we're a B2B um, marketing company ser ser selling a SaaS product. So it wouldn't necessarily be a tactic that many people would say should be well suited, but it fits really nicely into this whole idea of us building a media, a media machine. And so what we have done is identified subscription channels that we really care about, where we want to build an audience um, and we want to be able to have access to that audience to deliver all of this amazing subject matter led content. So the ones that we focus on are our podcast, our newsletters and our YouTube channel. But if you're starting out, pick the one that makes the most sense for your company today and just double down on it. Um, and, you know, we're lucky that we've got multiple resources and we can run um, we can run a few of these plays. And, we've, and we're finding that all of them, when we look at the human human based attribution and then also, um, you know, our sales force and everything else, that they're all contributing now into our demand funnel, which is great to see. And this one is really close to my heart, but this you can definitely do today. Change the way you think about the blog. This is like, I think, number one thing that I would start doing if I haven't done already. Um, the way I think about the blog is this should be your hub for searchable content. So again, going back to this media machine, it's like the news page. So it's your subject matter expert led. It, it's timely, it's journalistic. It's like, it's the place that you want your ICP to go and be able to search through all of your incredible content on demand. It's like the Netflix for your audience. And that should be what your blog is, not this place where you're a little bit ashamed to go into the archives of actually, quite frankly, because you have this content calendar that you committed to. You kind of decided these were the topics that you wanted to cover. Some of them are SEO based, some of them are just whims. Um, and actually when you look back at it, you're like, oh, time on page is absolutely diabolical. And, and also the number of people who or traffic that's ever been to those pages is like so low that why did we ever bother? So that would be a big one as well. Um, and that's really easy to do. And then finally, we all know video, video is important. So I would say just increasing the amount of video content that you produce is always going to be important, but you need to be doing that within the lens of, okay, is this subject matter led con expert led content? Is this, or and like, is this bottom of funnel content? Like it needs to be part of the meeting machine, part of all of the demand gen piece that you're building. Um, Sorry about that. I'm feeling personally attacked by that comment about feeling ashamed to go into the archives of the company blog. Uh, very, very, very sorry. But um, I did. I felt that way. When we went through this whole rebrand, I was like looking through like hundreds and hundreds of blog articles. I was like, how did I let that happen? How did I do this for so many years? And so I've been there, which is why I, I'm yeah advocating this strongly now. Um, and that's enough from me. So we'll talk about like those are all the ways I hope are super practical that you can get started with today but now Liam will talk you through okay you do that what about phase two meanwhile I'm gonna look through some questions and see if we can pick out some to go on to after Liam covers phase two awesome um yeah so I think half like it's it's funny like once you've like set out your your um strategy and idea and how you want to do it and then you've actually got to implement it and then you realize that you don't really have much of an idea about how you're going to do that um and the thing that's kind of uh, scary about it and also exciting about it is that there there's a you know there's a lot of direction that you can find out there from um different resources but 
there's a uh, very little like detailed direction and and figuring out i suppose that no like real playbook um to follow so we've kind of had to do a lot of that ourselves and set up those processes um ourselves too so uh but really focusing on it the first thing we really did was like think about this split between um your create demand activity and your capture demand activity um and uh so if we start with like that capture demand activity um so now we're sort of like basically setting things up in the basis of on like looking at it as at intent uh we don't want to be um capturing leads that aren't you know don't have that intent to um move forward and actually purchase the product i think one thing that we found really interesting is once you get rid of these lead gen content leads and say okay these uh there's no intent to buy here um and now we're only going to focus on inbounds um if you actually move your focus to the actual inbound lead itself you can actually end up over inflating those as well with your performance marketing and capture demand which is basically what we did at the beginning we 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 thought we desperately wanted more inbounds uh struggling to like move move that needle with um the create demand activity we were doing to begin with um and then you start looking towards like running um activity on like google ads it's actually like inflating the inbound number but not actually capturing the people um that you that you want and and the right people they're actually going to convert to pipeline so there's always we had to reshift our focus to pipeline um and follow that lead all the way from you know leads meeting book meeting tended to square for catch demand and make sure that we are you know only driving and capturing the right people um so like just a very simple way of like organizing that intent would be like that we'll have campaigns based on uh, starting off, you know, your high intent um, search terms, for example, if we're looking at it from like a Google Ads perspective, your competitors and your brand, but then deep diving that even further, you know, some competitors might be driving uh, leads that aren't converting further down the uh, um, into pipeline because there's various like different reasons why someone might be searching for one competitor or not. And we're like really starting to break this out and where we're going to put that focus in and like getting into the real detail of each of those um those key campaigns um and then when it came to create demand which i felt was like even more of a minefield i mean we've restructured our paid social account uh, and a lot of the content and stuff we're putting out there multiple times now uh to get this right into a place that we're we're, we're really happy um and it just takes a lot of you know refreshing and uh testing of everything that we're doing um one of the first things that we we went out with, with the, the aim is to get our own benchmarks, right? So we can start to measure whether what we were doing was at least worse or better than what we'd been doing before. Um, so, and also that meant we went through the exercise of collecting all of the metrics with create demand that was important to us. You know, what, what we're measuring, we're no longer, we're going for this longer term conversion and we're trying to influence uh, out of market buyers we're not trying to just we're not we can't measure it just like we used to with like um if we're putting ads out there just on like the number of leads we've got we've got to look at like all of like the the engagement rate uh comments likes uh and um uh, impressions and then also like the frequency that we've that that the ads been seen as well video views some stop ratio all of these metrics and then how do we piece these together to actually then say okay we well, we want to change the creative on this ad we want to update um this one or this isn't working or the frequency on this is too high um and we had to figure that out um and i must say like probably the uh unhelpful answer here is that that's actually completely individual to each business um i could share our benchmarks with with you and you'd find that they wouldn't necessarily work um for you either and ours are you know constantly modifying and updating these are like um live benchmarks really that are updating every um every couple of months so that we can keep track of what's working and what's not um and I in that the one oh, thing yeah, you could say i was just going to say um is that benchmarking your own campaigns against each other even in the very early days at least gives you um a guide of like okay this you may not yet know what good looks like but you'll know what good looks like in comparison to everything else and so at least then you'll know okay we might have one campaign where we're talking click-through rates of x and we've got one campaign which click-through rates of y this is like 
the, the best that we have so far. So that's what everyone should be leading towards right now. So benchmarking against yourself early on gives you something to go at, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And literally following our nose like that, we eventually saw the, you know, the, the inbounds, like um, we're tracking month and month, just rows and rows and rows, even if we can, you know, and that's where you get to have trust in the process that it's like, yeah, we can't, I can't see that that's directly attributed to these ads I put out, but uh, the general trend is exactly what I want to see. And that those that inbound number is growing and that pipeline number is growing. And so we'll keep moving to these benchmarks on, on engagement and um, yeah, on engagement and all of those like softer metrics that we know that people are actually like interacting with our content and, and enjoying it. Um, and then when we've restructured these paid social accounts, we now think about things in like, and especially if I use LinkedIn as an example, we think about all of the audiences and type of content that we want to serve uh, and we serve it to everyone all at once. So uh, we'll have, um, that means that everyone in the ICP gets content. It's uh, like all the time, whether it's top of funnel, bottom of funnel, it's always on because um, we can't tell what anyone is in that buying journey. And that's how we set up the accounts in that, in that way. Um, you know, we've, rethought about who we're serving it to and what content people get whether that's far to like evangelize our like users or whether to influence the top-down decision makers and they'll get slightly separate content but still structured in um the in the same way and then we're thinking about all of our individual segments as well um and we're thinking about when we're creating a demand going forward so we have a bucket for thought leadership and content and then we have buckets to educate on the product um, and with social proof as well. And then like a final bucket for then retargeting, which like wraps in all of those those buckets together. Um, and then this is something that we've just, we're constantly, it's like, it's a, like it's fluid. The whole thing is changing um, all the time and we're amending it and like changing like the budget distribution between capture demand and create demand as and when is required um, because it can't just stay static. Um, I know a lot of people would say out there that that spit is 20, like 20% 20 catch demand, 80% create demand. Again, it's completely dependent on your business and it also changes with the macroeconomic environment and everything else that's um, going on around you. So it has to change month on month um, as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could probably, and I reckon maybe this is something that we go in further into the loop, like go into any of these things more in detail. Um, and I feel like I could go on about it forever, but I think we should dig into some let's dig it. Yeah, let's dig into some of these questions. So um, there's loads, but we'll start with, because I think this is quite an interesting one. Would love for you to cover what, if any role, lead scoring plays in a demand gen approach. And when talking high intent leads, are you talking straight demo request submissions? Is this, in fact, a new MQL? Now, this is really interesting because I think that mm. this is when you need to understand, like, everyone's definitions of everything is different, right? So I guess um, at Cognizant, for us, what a MQL was in the old world was a content lead, so call it a content lead, something that has come from anything that is not a demo request. And then what we call a declared intent demo request is literally what it says. It's someone coming to the website and either requesting for pricing or requesting for, um, or requesting a demo of Cognizant. And so that those now are our MQLs because we don't have content needs. So when, when RevOps are looking at how marketing's doing from an MQL perspective, even though we're not piled to an MQL target, those, the direct declared intent demo requests are MQLs for us now. But in the old world, there was two very clear definitions of what an MQL was because they're not all created equally. You have assumed intent, which is anything that's content or that's not a demo request. And then you have declared intent, which is that are those which are, I want a demo request. I am expecting you to get in contact with me and I am expecting to see a demonstration of your product. And that is a declared intent from the customer. And so what do we do when it comes to lead scoring and like what role do we see its place in demand gen? So I think the good news here is that leads, the whole lead scoring world was set up for lead gen, really, like this whole lead gen, um, lead gen play. And it was a way in which you would create some sophisticated model to help you uh, identify those leads that were more likely to be converted by sales um, above that 0.2% than others, essentially. Now, when you are talking about declared intent only, so that's everyone 
who wants to actually see a demonstration of your product. There is definitely still um, an element where I think lead, like I would say lead grading over lead scoring because the, the intent is already there. Like the, we're not talking about needing to score people on intent because the intent level is the same for everyone. But the score that we might give um, someone who is declared intent might differ because of the attributes of that person. So it might be because they come from a slightly smaller organization. They don't have some of the sales tech stack that we would um, integrate with. There might be other factors that we know would make um, someone have a higher chance of converting further down the line. And so we might want to score them differently based on that only so that we can understand what distribution of scores we're bringing in. And if we're like, that can help us with our audience targeting. That can help us um, try and ensure that we're, you know, we are focused on the A's and B's. And it can also help um, with how you decide to route those um, those leads into the, either into the AE team or into the whatever MDR team, however you service demo requests in your business. So um, we use lead scoring as a mechanism for holding marketing accountable for the type of quality that we're bringing in when it comes to declared intent. And also for us to determine how we route those um, those prospects when they do show declared intent. We have different teams who will deal with different types of business. And that's a, a great way for us to um, ensure that they're getting rooted in the correct way. So I would say, you know, that's more sophisticated. I don't think it's necessarily um, required in the early days because as I say, all intent um, is declared at the point in which you're doing full demand gen. Yeah. And you'd add? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say that, yeah, like that, really the scoring bit that goes out the window is the is the bit, like the engagement bit, because you, right, you know that you can't, you don't know when anyone's ready to buy, whether they've read five emails and downloaded a piece of content. So you're not going to change, you know, you're not, and someone's put their hand up to see a demo, they're all of, you know, the score like their engagement scores the same they're, they're all just saying they want to see the demo um so that bit goes out the window and you don't really need to be tracking that anymore in the same way the bit that obviously doesn't change is that what like alice said like the grading bit where you're deciding you know we know that um x individuals from uh, x industry uh, x size company convert really well um and maybe we actually want to and we want to make sure that our demand generation efforts are bringing in as many of these people as possible so that's a way of holding us to account to account and also if these people do come in inbound you kind of want to give them the the vip experience to to get straight through to an ae um and see someone asap um because they're going to be the best uh, people to um convert so yeah basically same like a bit different way of looking at it really um because we know we know that engagement level they've, they've come in and requested a demo yeah, great, amazing. And then we have a really good question about um, subject matter experts. I'm not gonna be able to disclose how much we pay our SMEs because um, we have multiple ones and um, everyone has a slightly different arrangement depending on what works for them, what works for us, et cetera, where they sit in the organization. So, um, but what I kept, this was a question around like talking about the level of experience. And so I guess my steering to you on this is it really depends and it, it comes down to like, what is the what is the what are the topics what are the things that your icp truly cares about and that's going to really dictate to you the type of person that you're going to need who should be um who should be effective as an sme now for cognizant if i give a really practical example this was really interesting for us to work through in the sales um world because what we knew was that we didn't just want someone it's like uh, it's like um, those TV chefs. Neil and I use this analogy. You use this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's this whole idea of like, would people actually value sales advice from a TV chef, someone who's never actually been on the forefront of cold calling, or is not actually sending cold outreach emails every day? Like, probably not, because let's be honest, things change every day. Like the way it's the people who are literally sending cold outreach talking to people on the phone every day who are gonna have the most that they like, yeah, the most experience to share with our audience and the most insights. So that means that we weren't so much interested in a number of years of experience. We were interested in someone who was doing it every day. Like that was the main thing for us. And then there's a few other things you need to think about. If they're gonna be on video, they need to actually carry themselves well. They need to be able to speak well. Um, they need to have obviously capacity to take on this work because it might be additional to a full-time job in sales, whatever that might look like. So I would just say 
think that it through in that respect, not like a number of years experience that's required or anything like that. It's really who's going to have this practical real world advice that our customers and prospects really care about. And yeah, that was how we, we decided on um, our experts in the end and it's worked out really well. Um, anything, yeah, anything more you'd say on that, Liam? Um, yeah, I mean, basically same, but like, I would just think that when choosing, I, I feel like I've learned this along the way as well with, with subject matter experts, like you have this trade-off, right, between um, great content creator, super personable, um, uh, and then you have like versus super maybe knowledgeable and knows the, the industry inside and out, um, but can they deliver it? And it's like searching for someone with that right balance and they don't actually need to have, you know, years of experience to be able to, if they can deliver the information really well. Um, and, the, and, and you know, you can, you can help feed a subject matter expert as well with things and stuff that they can go out and, and find themselves. So there's like this balance between creator and like subject matter expert. Um, and I think that was, yeah, where the, the sort of TV chef analogy comes from. Basically, my dad's a chef and he absolutely hates all TV chefs because he thinks they couldn't, you know, cut the kitchen. Uh, and I suppose that's the kind of it, like the TV chef, he's great at presenting. But then if my dad was on camera, uh, he wouldn't be able to do their job either. So it's got to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, amazing. Um, now, I wanted to quickly cover this as well, because I thought it was quite an interesting question, but it was about getting buy-in from different types of execs for the shift. And obviously, this is really important. And um, not just actually for for this situation, so from shifting from lead gen to demand gen, but for anything that you end up um, doing as a marketing leader, you're going to have to get buy-in from the exec team. And I think, um, and also just generally in your like day-to-day -day role, it's so important to communicate effectively with them. And I And I talk about this quite a lot. I talk about almost needing to be a linguist as a marketer. And I don't mean that in the sense that I need to be fluent in French, German, and Spanish, although that would be really helpful, so I wish I was. But I mean it in the terms of being fluent in CFO, VP sales, CRO, CEO, and they all care about different things. So if you're going into your first, if you're, if you're new into an organization, you're going into, or you're going into your first leadership role, or you still haven't necessarily really found this out, spend the time to understand what it is that they care about and like it becomes really apparent so for me i know that our ceo he really cares about number one have i hired a great team that's really happy like he always cares about the people first and then he really really wants us to have a brand like he wants to know that this idea and concept that he thought about in his office 20 years ago it wasn't 20 years ago but you know whatever it is um is actually evolving into something far greater that can be this um yeah this this big thing beyond his wildest dreams I guess and he wants to make sure that that's in safe hands and that's being communicated well and that we're building this momentum behind it and finally he's an entrepreneur so he wants to know that I'm innovative he never never wants us to stop he never ever wants us to be like happy with like status quo and so I could play into those things when I was talking to him about this new way of doing things um, I could really lean into the fact that it was innovative. I could really lean into the fact that it was going to make my team happier. And these were the things that I really pushed with the CEO. Versus when I was talking to the VP sales, he cares about his team hitting target or quota. That's it. Like, that's literally the number one thing. Whenever I meet with them, it's like, okay, like, we're slightly falling behind here or you know, we're doing well here. Like, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's talk about quotas and targets. So I had to go to him with a business case of, I hold the marketing revenue target. I sign up to it. I deliver it to you month on month and I continue to maintain that I'll be able to do that. But the upside for you is that I'm going to free up all of your outbound reps to focus more on outbound. So the fact, the chances of them hitting their quota and target is also going to go up. So the chances are we're going to overachieve. And so that was the way that I would position it to the VP sales. And then for the CFO, it was all about the money. It's like, okay, how much is this going to cost me or how much is this going to save me? And that was where I could show him, okay, well, you tell me what our 2023 target's going to look like. And he'd give me like a rough idea and breakdown. And I said, okay, well, our model out, if we get stuck with the MQL model, well, that's going to cost you. Versus our model out, if we actually successfully pivot to demand gen, what that will cost you. And in terms, that's in terms of human resource, but then also like the cost per lead and like the financial program costs, et cetera. And 
that became a really, really, really powerful picture for him. And you could just see the cogs turning of like, this is much more efficient. I could definitely present this to the board. So that's like, yeah, that's my kind of tips for the buy-in phase is everyone needs to see it differently and you need to understand what those sort of levers are that they care about. And that's what, that's the way to position it. Um, well, that's definitely how I found, found it worked at Cognizant. Um, any other questions that you particularly want to jump in on, Liam, before we wrap things up? Just having a look. Um... I know we're actually over time. Oh, are we? Okay, maybe we come back to some of the some of these. Okay, well, maybe we should just take, we'll take Sam, your question, because you've just put, put, put one in there, which I think is quite a good one. If you were working for a startup, would you spend your time and money on brand awareness or building content for demand gen? If both, how would you divvy up resources when ultimately acquisition is important? It's quite interesting that I think you are separating brand awareness from um, building content for demand gen, because I actually like strongly believe that the content is what builds the brand awareness and actually makes the demand gen successful, like a hundred percent. So um, obviously how you then deliver that and like the delivery of that content is where you're going to have to invest some money behind paid if you're going to use like um, like social, paid social, but equally you can use organic channels and you can, as we were talked about before, there's lots of stuff you can do to scale this without necessarily needing to overly heavily invest on the paid side. But I would my my advice is that the the most of your time, energy, and thought needs to go into the content side of it because that ultimately is what will make it successful. Because content covers, like we said, four huge buckets for us. That's what does thought leadership content look like for my audience? What does content look like when I talk about content? That stuff that something that is relevant to my audience with a dotted line back to product. And what does our bottom of funnel product content look like for my audience? And what does our social proof content look for, like for our audience? And also, how does that work when we talk about SEO and everything like there's just so much in the content piece and how does that feed the demand gen engine the media machine mm -hmm. so yeah I would be putting a lot of time and energy into that mm -hmm. yeah I agree with that content's like the the central pillar to all of it and you, you could have one subject matter expert or like one facet thing pushing out great content and that's what will deliver you brand awareness um so I would yeah content you have contents the starting place for sure. And we are, I believe, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, going to be having a special The Loop Live episode all around how you actually structure and build content engine for demand gen with Todd and Abade. I really hope we're not making fake promises here. We are indeed. Okay. And that, so hopefully that will be a great, um, yeah, a great, great starting point for, for anyone who's trying to think about like tackling this, because I think the other thing that we've learned as we've been building out our own playbook at Cognizant, we got to a really good point with it all, but we were like, we still don't have like a scalable process around the content um, creation. And like, it's really the content creation ideation piece and that, and like what the frequency of that looks like and how we communicating that with our um, audience. And that's what Todd and Obeyed were amazing at delivering for us. And that's what's created this scalable, repeatable engine. Um, and so we are going to share that all with you, which was, um, months worth of learning for us so hopefully that'll be super valuable um okay that is i think we're going to wrap it up but please do send us feedback like how was this for you especially compared to demandisms was it um as useful more useful any feedback much appreciated it would have been recorded and that will be shared with you and the slides after as well um and yeah that's it from us so thanks everyone for turning up and have a great afternoon or morning depending where you are. Yeah, thanks guys.